Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is so great to see you. I'm pleased you've joined us today. My name is Johnny. My wife Tasha and I have the honour and the privilege of leading Liberty Church London together. You're going to meet her a little bit later on as she continues our teaching series as we deep dive into the book of Mark. I am super excited because four weeks today, Right now, at this time in four weeks, we're going to be back in the Jazz Cafe in Camden Town uh, in person, relaunching services where we can see each other face to face. I am pumped. I cannot wait. If you haven't had a chance, please, 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 please reserve your tickets like now, like right now. It's going to be limited spaces because we're keeping uh, social distancing up. So. Go to our website, libertyshareslondon.com and save your seat. Or you can just click in the link below, just down there. You can click to save, to go to the right page and save your seat. But maybe don't just save your seat. Get in touch with some friends, some family, some neighbors, some colleagues. Don't come alone, bring them along too. We're gonna have a fantastic Sunday. But we're also gonna have a fantastic Sunday now. We're gonna go over uh, to Andy, who's gonna lead us in some more worship. So I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Let's, let's turn the volume up, maybe hit full screen, and let's worship God together, wherever you are. Let's lift up our voices and our praises to him. Yeah. 
want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door we want you lord like never before your presence is an open door so come now lord like never Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling you. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is
Oh, Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that your love for us is so deep that we can come to you. We can come to your altar. It doesn't matter what we've done, what we haven't done, what we've seen, what we haven't seen, what we've said or what we haven't said. We can come to the altar. We can come into your presence. You love us so much that you just, you love it when we draw close to you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, if you join us regularly at Liberty Church London's online service, you will know that we believe in prayer. We believe it has the power to transform any and every situation. And one of the things we've been able to do a lot in this season, and it's been a real honor for us, is to stand with people in prayer. So if you've got a prayer request, if there's something that you need breakthrough for, please fill out the form. There's a link in the description below. I think it just says, ask for prayer. Please fill out that form. Let us know what you are needing. Let us know what you're asking God for. Let us know what your heart is breaking for so we can stand with you. We can pray with you. Myself and Tasha will get that form and we'll pray for you. But so will our prayer team. They'll be praying for you also because we, we believe that God can and does break through in any and every situation. In fact, quite a few times we've prayed for something one week and the next week we've been given a, a praise report uh, because someone has asked for prayer, we've prayed for them and with them and then the next, by the time the next week comes around, they've had that answer to their prayer. So if you've got an answer to prayer, something that you're celebrating, please share it with us. We want to celebrate with you. So if you click the same link, fill out the same form, you can just fill it out as a praise report rather than a prayer request. And we can celebrate what God has done in your life together. Now, if this is your first time joining us, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for joining us. You could be anywhere doing, well, you couldn't really be anywhere. We're in lockdown, but you could be in watching Netflix or something but you've chosen to watch our online service and we appreciate that and we would love to connect with you. Lips Church London is a community we're not just a crowd and community begins with connection so again in the link in the description below there's a link uh, to fill out an online connect card if you just take a moment to fill out that uh, form that will allow Tash and I to be able to reach out to you personally I know forms are quite in like they're, they're not fun <laughs> they're, they're not very welcoming filling out a form no one wants to fill out a form but if actually if you could do that then that will allow us to reach out with you to you and connect with you in person which is what we'd love to do now if you're part of Liberty Church London we just want to say thank you so much for your continued generosity in this season for continuing to faithfully give your tithes and your offerings as a church we believe that god calls us to tithe a tenth of what he gives us back to him by giving it to the church we believe that this is a act of faith it's saying i trust god with my finances i'm going to put my money literally where my mouth is and i'm going to tithe and give back 10 percent of what God's given me, I'm going to trust that by giving that 10%, by being faithful with my tithe, that he's going to take that 90% that remains in my bank account, that he's going to make it go further than the 100% ever could have. Now, I, we believe in it because Tash and I deeply believe in it. We've had this crazy experience month in, month out of even in the tightest of times when we tithe, God just has made that 90% go further. Does it make sense in like the world? No. But does it work? Well, that's what we've seen again and again and again. I honestly believe that the greatest beneficiary of tithing is the person who tithes. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to thank you for doing it, for being so faithful in this season. If you'd like to give, you can see all the details at the bottom of the screen. But hey, what a generous church we are. We're going to continue our teaching series in a moment. In fact, Tasha, who I've mentioned a few times but you haven't quite met yet, is going to continue the teaching series on Mark. If you've missed any of the messages so far, they're all on YouTube, they're all on our channel. I encourage you to watch them all. It was solid gold. Uh, Geffen last week was just dropping microphone after microphone after microphone. It was a fantastic message. And you know what? Every single one has been gold. So we're going to continue in a moment. We're going to pass it over to Tasha, but first, let's watch Church News. Mm -hmm. 
Well, hey there, church. I have some big and exciting news. We are going to be regathering as a church on Sunday, the 18th of April. We would love you to join us at the Jazz Cafe in Camden Town. We are super excited to meet. It's going to be great to see each other's faces, or at least eyes, because we're still going to have masks on. Uh, we've tried to move at the speed of health throughout this entire pandemic, and we feel that the 18th is the right date to reopen. Many of the restrictions are loosened on the 12th of April, uh, so it's going to be a great time with London beginning to come back to life again. We hope you can come. Um, there's going to be a full regathering plan on our website if you want to check out all the, all the precautions that we're going to continue to be taking. One of those precautions though, and this is vital, is we need to pre-register. Uh, we would like everyone to come, but everyone does need to pre-register because sadly, there are only limited spaces. So pre-registration is on libertychurchlondon.com and it is open right now. So please go and sign up, sign yourself up, your friends, your family, whoever is going to be joining us at the Jazz Cafe. We want to make sure everyone's pre-registered, everyone feels safe, and everyone is ready to gather together again, to worship again, to be community again. Oh, I am super excited. I hope you are too. Roll on the 18th of April. Well, hey church, I get the honor and privilege of bringing today's message. Now we're nearing the end of our series called Pursuing Jesus based on the book of Mark. And we are passionate about pursuing Jesus's ways together here in London. And I want you to join us as we do that. The book of Mark is an extraordinary account of Jesus' life, ministry, death and resurrection. And so what better way to learn about how to follow Jesus than to learn from the man himself through his stories, his teachings, his actions, all the way through the book of Mark. Well, in a moment, we're going to be going through chapter 10 together, but can I encourage you to read the book of Mark with us? We have a daily Bible reading plan that we've been going through, and even if you've missed out on the last few weeks, why not join now? Can I encourage you that reading the Bible, not on a Sunday, so throughout the week, can really transform your faith? So let me encourage you to take that up this week. So we're going to go into the book of Mark together. We're going to look through chapter 10 in a few different chunks. Now in chapter 10 we see an account of when a few interactions with Jesus and the disciples and these interactions help to clarify why Jesus came and how we can truly follow him. You see when he came to the earth he really switched things up. You know, for the disciples and the powers that be of the day, he really flipped everything on its head. And even today, 2,000 years later, we often read some of the things that Jesus said, and he's just flipped everything upside down. And so today, it's the same. And he starts out with a, a surprising story, a surprising encounter with a group of children. So let's read together Mark 10, 13 to 16. And it says this. The people brought children to Jesus, hoping that he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate and let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very centre of life in the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. Wow, not only did Jesus just rebuke the disciples, but then he told them that they should be like the people they didn't even think were worthy of being in his presence. Wow. You know, I have two kids and I believe kids are a huge blessing and gift from God. They are cute and adorable and fun and they bring so much laughter to my life, but they are still kids. And uh, it's, I still find it strange that Jesus calls us to be like them. You know, my kids, and I'm sure if you've been around kids at all, will always ask the question why. Not once or twice, but like a hundred times. They have no idea of the concept of personal space. One thing I've struggled with a lot in this last year. You know, they say the funniest things and sometimes it's really sweet, but they also say the most embarrassing things. You have to be so careful about what you say around children because they will repeat it. You know, they're not, they're not independent, they, have, they need help with lots of things, and yet Jesus asks us to be like them. Why? 
Because a kid's faith is simple. It's a simple faith. It is humble and it trusts. And that's what Jesus wants from us. The two children came to Jesus with their wants and their needs, and they came wanting a blessing from him. They weren't afraid to ask for what they needed, for what they wanted. You know, my kids are not afraid to ask for things. They come up to me, JJ particularly will want a snack every five minutes of the day. And if we go for a walk, five steps later, he's, he's already ready for a carry. And he's not afraid to ask for it. He might get a no sometimes, but a yes others. But he's not, he's not scared of asking for it. He's not prideful. He's not trying to push through. He's humble enough to say, hey, I need help. You know, Jesus wants us to be like that with God. He wants us to go to him and ask for what we need. We don't need to willpower our way through our life. We don't need to put a mask on to pretend that we're all okay. We don't need to be afraid of asking for what we need. We can openly and honestly come to God with our desires, what things that we need, things that we want in our lives. We can confess our sins to him and ask him for forgiveness. And Jesus is right there, ready for us. You know, Jesus also encourages us to do that with one another. Be open with one another. Be a community where we can share our burdens. You know, kids don't worry about telling each other what they're feeling. They don't worry about telling us what they're feeling and wondering how are we going to respond, how are we going to think about them. You know, JJ is really happy to have a meltdown, full meltdown in the middle of the supermarket. He's not worried about what anyone's going to think about him. We need to be open enough and humble enough to say, hey, I need help. Not just to Jesus, but to each other. And at the same time as being humble, a child's faith is simply trusting. I had a conversation with JJ the other day um, when he was, I was putting him to bed and he said to me, Mummy, if I have a bad dream, I will pray to Jesus and he will take it away because he lives in my heart. It's just so sweet. You know, JJ is not concerned about the, whether or not Jesus will take away the, his bad dreams or not because he is trusting, simply trusting that Jesus will. He's not worried about whether he said the prayer eloquently enough. He's not worried about whether he's been a good enough boy that week or he's served enough in the ministry of the church. He just knows that when he asks Jesus to take away his bad dreams, that that's going to happen. The older we get, the harder it is actually to just trust simply. I know I often struggle with trusting in things and wondering, is there a catch? Is there, you know, is there an asterisk or an exclusion that counts me out? I had a phone call the other day with Sky. We were moving house and so I needed a new broadband provider. And so I phoned them up. I'd seen a deal online. It was £25 for broadband. I thought, yeah, that'll do. So I phoned them up and I was on this conversation with this guy and I could feel he was trying to upsell me. Like they all do, right? He was like, hey, I could give you some, I could give you a phone and a TV package as well. And I just said to him, oh, thanks, but I just really want the broadband package. He's like, okay, well, I can give that to you for 25 quid, but I can also give you the broadband phone and the TV for 25 quid. My initial reaction is, okay, but what's the catch? I said to him, what's the catch? There's got to be a catch. Why would they both be exactly the same? And he said, there isn't one. It's just what we've got an offer at the moment. It was so hard to trust that because I was adamant that there must be an asterisk or a little exclusion that counts me out of this deal. And we often do that with our faith. We say, well, God's only going to provide for me if I do this. But that's not God. That's not who he is. He doesn't have asterisks or exclusions uh, or amendments. He, he's, he's ready to give to us and to bless us. We need to trust in him without being worried about disqualifying ourselves. Hebrews 11.6 says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Simple trust in the character of a God who loves us is not immature, it's not misguided, it's not naive, it's the very thing that pleases God. And it moves mountains, heals bodies, restores relationships, frees captives, 
You know, that simple faith and that simple trust is what makes things happen. So where do we need to trust God more in our lives? Where there's no amendment, no asterisks, no exclusions. Where do we need to let him lead us and stop disqualifying ourselves with things that we think God is doing? Simple faith is simple, but it's not easy. And after the disciples got a lesson from the preschool, they came face to face with some obstacles that get in the way of simple faith. So let's read Mark 10, 17 to 25. It says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, I have kept all these since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said it again. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This man came earnestly seeking a blessing from Jesus, much like the parents and the children had done previously in the chapter. But instead of leaving with the blessing, he left discouraged. Why? Because of something, an obstacle that he had created was standing in the way of him receiving this blessing. The idol of wealth that we can often fall prey to as well. Many of us will read the words extremely wealthy, that this man was extremely wealthy and therefore will disassociate ourselves from him. Well, I'm not wealthy. I've got bills to pay. I've got a student loan. I live with four flatmates. I don't have a Ferrari. I don't have a big penthouse suite in the city. And therefore, I can't have the idol of wealth. And so because we're not the J.K. Rowlings or the David Beckhams or the Richard Bransons, we think that we are, we are okay and we're not going to suffer and, and fall prey to that idol. But actually it's not about the amount of money that you have, it's about the place in, the, in your heart that you put money. You see, it doesn't matter whether you have a big paycheck or a small paycheck, a big house or a small house, it's about the, the place of value you put money in your, in your heart and whether it brings you significance or purpose rather than Jesus. Let's read together two Tim 1 Timothy, sorry, 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10, and it says this. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Notice here that money is not the root of the evil. The love of money is. That shows us two things. Firstly, it shows us that um, money is neither good nor bad. It's a resource and how we use it determines whether it's a catalyst for good or a catalyst for bad. And secondly, we learn that actually anyone can have wealth as an idol. Whether you're financially thriving or financially struggling, wealth can be something that you place in that priority slot. You know, the love of our money or the wealth um, actually reveals itself in subtle ways. It can show up when we're rubbing shoulders with those who earn more than us and whether we feel content or not in that. It can show up in how we treat those that we think have less than us. It shows up in what we pursue or the goals what we're going after in terms of getting more money or are we trying to make a greater difference. And it shows up when we're trying to pursue that one thing that we think is going to bring us significance or purpose or happiness that we can't currently afford. 
You know, we can all fall prey to this idol, the idol of wealth. And Jesus is calling us to actually pursue him, not money. And ironically, in this passage, we see that Jesus was actually offering this man way more than he actually currently had. Jesus was offering this man a chance to make a phenomenal impact to those around him. He was offering him a chance to come and follow Jesus and to play a part in kingdom purpose. He was offering him way more than the man actually had. And Jesus is offering us the same choice. Are we going to pursue Jesus or are we going to pursue our wealth? Now, the disciples witnessed this. They've encountered the children and been told that they had need to have simple faith. They then encountered this idol of wealth. And then they go on to encounter another idol, the idol of comfort. So let's carry on reading the Bible. Mark 10, 26. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left their home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The young ruler was unwilling to leave the comforts that he'd got used to. And yet Jesus is here reminding the disciples and commending them for all that they have left. Reminding them that they will receive blessings not only here on earth, but in the kingdom to come. They will receive eternal life. I wonder how often, myself included, we want to follow Jesus but actually don't want to make a big sacrifice. We'll stand there and say, Jesus, please bless me, but don't make me bless anyone else. God, I need your forgiveness, but please don't ask me to forgive that person. Or God, use me for your glory, but don't make me step out of my comfort zone. But when we look at this passage, Jesus is saying, we have to, we have to leave things. We have to leave our comfort. And this is the idol of comfort that Jesus is talking about. We have to let go of things. We have to move past our comfort zone to really pursue Jesus fully. And yes, it will cost us things. It will cost us material possessions. It will cost us sitting nice and comfortably. It will cost us stepping into some areas of fear But Jesus says there will be a reward. There is cost, but there is great reward. A.W. Tozer says this, how utterly terrible it is this current idea of Christians that we can serve God at our own convenience. Wow, that we can serve God at our own convenience. I wonder how many of us, I know I have, have felt that before, that we only want to serve God when it feels convenient to us. So where do we need to make sacrifices at the moment in our lives to exchange it for encountering more of the presence of God? What comforts at this moment do we need to give up to pursue Jesus and his plans for us further? And the final idol that the disciples encounter during this chapter is the idol of selfishness. So let's carry on with chapter 10, verse 35, that says this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become a servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
James and John make this very bold request in this passage. They want to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus. And that quickly reveals that they haven't actually been listening to what Jesus has been teaching in the last section. It reminds me of those times when we, I was a kid, and I'm sure you might, might have encountered this too, when you were sat in a class, um, maybe an English class, that was the one I generally did my daydreaming, and you look out the window and you start daydreaming, and then suddenly your teacher is t- said, okay, get on with the task, and you're like, I can't remember what the task was, I didn't pay attention. And so you like put your hand and like, sorry miss, what are we supposed to be doing? And it reveals to the entire class that you were not paying attention. That's exactly what is happening in this passage. James and John have just revealed that, hey, we weren't listening to that. We want prestige, we want power. And actually Jesus has been teaching about sacrifice and service. While describing his expectations for his disciples, Jesus uses two different words, diakonos and doulos. Now, diakonos is Greek, and it means hand servant, and that's the one that's found in verse 43. It basically implies a high-powered servant, someone who is an administrator for the house. It's a fairly okay place in in the position of the hierarchy. It's not the worst, it's not the best. So it must, it's all right for James and John, right? But doulos is different, it has a completely different meaning. This was an enslaved person. This was someone who had no standing, no rights, and they were subject to the will of their master. If the disciples want to follow Jesus and be first, then they had to choose to be a slave, to be put Jesus first, to serve him and others before their own needs. Here's the great paradox of the gospel. In one sense, the gospel is all about you. It's about you. Jesus came to this earth to save you. Save you from the power of sin and death. He died on the cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. He loves you. He calls you. He chose you. He chooses you. You matter to God more than anything um, and any, more than anyone can ever comprehend. It's about you. And at the same time, equally, We are called to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, to not seek our own will, but to become more and more like Jesus, to put others' needs above ours, to understand that we're not the hero in our story, Jesus is, and that by following Jesus and living like Jesus, we encounter true salvation. It's not about you. It's all about you, and it's not about you all at the same time. And here we find that the disciples completely forgot that second part of the equation. They wanted power and prestige, and yet Jesus calls us to sacrifice and service. They were looking out for number one. Jesus calls us to look out for each other. So I wonder, where is there room for you to grow in serving others? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your family, or with a co-worker, or with some friends. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says this, Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good that put together that overwhelm the world. Let's return to having a simple faith today. Can I encourage you to do that? Can I encourage you to be humble enough to ask Jesus for what you need? Humble enough to burden, release your burdens by sharing them with those around you? Can I encourage you to trust, just simply trust, to remove the asterisks and the exclusions that you have put on that disqualify you? And then can I encourage us to lay down our idols? Let's lay down the idol of wealth, of comfort and of selfishness as we pursue Jesus together. Maybe today you've been hearing something about the fact that Jesus chose you and died for you to save you. And maybe today you're ready to make that decision to follow him by picking up your own cross and sacrificing so that you can serve him. Well, if that's you today, I'd love to pray for you. So can you just close your eyes and repeat after me? Father God, I thank you that you chose me, that you love me and that you died for me. Today I choose you, I choose to follow you, and I pick up my cross to serve you as I walk humbly and trusting as I follow you. Amen. Amen.
Well, if you made that decision today, can I be the first to congratulate you on making one of the best decisions you can make? Following Jesus is not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done in the context of community. So can I encourage you to let us know that you made that decision today? If you click the link in the description below called Connect With Us, you can fill in the Connect card and let us know that you made the decision today. And we can reach out to you during the week and send you a Bible to help you as you follow Jesus. I hope you have a great Sunday, everyone. But let's remember to have a simple faith and to lay down our idols. Wow, Tasha, thank you so much for that incredible message. I feel encouraged, inspired, and challenged all at the same time. If you made the decision today to follow Jesus, please do let us know. It may be the first time ever, it may be the first time in a long time, but we want to celebrate with you. We like to celebrate as a church. We also want to give you a gift of a Bible. So if you could uh, go to the link in the description below uh, and fill out that online connect card. You may have done it before, but fill out again and uh, there's a link, you, there's a button you can press which says, I made the decision to follow Jesus. Tick that button. Do you tick buttons? Press that button. And uh, then Tash and I will be able to send you a Bible. Now you may have a hundred Bibles at home already. We want to send you another one. Why? Because we believe when you make a decision to follow Jesus, it's worth marking the occasion. It's worth celebrating. So we want to send you a Bible to mark the moment that you said yes to following Jesus. But we also believe following Jesus isn't a one-off thing. It's a journey, and it's something that we don't do on our own. We want to walk that journey with you. So we'll also be able to help you to walk that journey following Jesus. Fantastic. Well, you've got another moment now to go and book your place, ugh, book your place or reserve your space for church in person at the Jazz Cafe in Camden Town on the 18th of April. Please do it now, like right now. I know you're thinking, oh, I might go get my dinner, have a cup of coffee. No, come on, it'll take you three minutes. Book your space and we'll see you on the 18th. But before then, we'll see you next week.